good to bring God's word to you this morning. Um, this morning we're going to be looking at the fourth sermon in this series that I've been doing lessons from Galatians, from the book of Galatians. Um, and today's today's lesson, or today's sermon, is entitled The Two Covenants. The Two Covenants. So if you have a Bible with you, if you'd like to turn to Galatians. We're going to turn to Galatians chapter 4. <coughs> Heavenly Father, Lord God, I just praise you and thank you that we have your word before us. Lord, your word is truth. And I pray, Lord, this morning that the truth of this word, Father, might come and find its place in our hearts. And through that truth, Lord, we might know the freedom and the liberty that is in Christ. Lord, that it might be ours. Lord, and that we might consequently give thanks to you and praise to you for the freedom that it gives us. In Jesus' name. Amen. So the two covenants. A covenant is an agreement. And in this case, it is an agreement between God and people. So it's worth keeping that in mind this morning. Uh, and as Christians we talk about the new covenant which was uh, both established and illustrated through the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's have a look. Galatians chapter 4 and I'm going to read from verse 21. Tell me Ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory? For these are two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. For Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of of us all. So that requires a bit of explanation, I think, um, as we think about that. So Paul says to the church in Galatia, do you not hear the law? So remember, this is a church that has been influenced by false teachers. Teachers who come along and say, oh well, you're not really a Christian uh, unless you've been circumcised. You're not really a Christian unless you're observing the law of Moses. And they wanted to bring back those kind of, you know, don't eat pork and you, know, you have to observe this kind of ritual and ceremony. And they wanted to bring that back. So Paul is sort of saying to the church in, in Galatia, okay, if you want to play that game, uh, let's think about this. Do you not hear the law since you think so much of it? Uh, and the law in Hebrew is known as the Torah. So you probably heard that, the Torah. The Torah is made up of the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. And Paul is saying this because now he's going to make reference to the, the first book, the book of Genesis, and once again to the life of Abraham. We saw that last week. If you didn't see it, you can catch up with it. It's on our, on our YouTube channel. We should be in there, I think. Um, so yes, he's making reference to Abraham, and he uses Abraham as an example, as a teaching tool to steer the Galatians away from a false gospel and back to the real gospel. And that's been the kind of theme, hasn't it, of these series of sermons. It's like, no, we don't want a false gospel, because that's no gospel at all. We want to know what is the real gospel, what is the real good news. So... Uh, he gives this, this illustration, he says, Abraham had two sons, one by a bondmaid, 
the other by a free woman. So if you remember, if, you, if you've read about Abraham, Abraham has a wife, Sarah, and God promises that she will have a child. And this would be a miracle because uh, she's so old and, uh, and she couldn't have any children. All her life she wanted a child, but she's not been able to have one. So, uh, in Genesis 16, verse 2, having, having received this news, uh, Sarah suggests a way in which she and Abraham might help God. Okay? Just be very careful of trying to help God do something. And so, what she does is she makes a suggestion. See, Sarah has an Egyptian maid called Hagar. And Sarah says, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. In other words, now, now that I can't actually have any children, I pray thee, go into my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. So she's saying, well, I can't actually have children, but God says I'm going to have a child. So maybe this is it. Maybe God wants you, Abraham, to go into my maid and, and have a child with her. And that would kind of be my child. And there's maybe that's how the miracle is going to work. And Abraham listened to his wife and Hagar uh, gave birth to a child. And that child was Ishmael. But then, by the miracle of God, a second child is fathered by Abraham. This time with Sarah, his wife, and this child is Isaac. So, we end up with two mothers, Hagar and Sarah, and two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael is conceived in the natural way, born after the flesh, that's how Paul describes it, but Isaac is conceived uh, in a supernatural way by the miracle of God and is therefore the fulfillment of faith. This, this is the whole point of what Paul's going to be saying here. He's like, okay, so there's Sarah, Abraham's wife, and there's Hagar, who's a bond servant. And there are two children born. One is born of the flesh by just normal, natural means. Uh, the other is a miracle child. Okay, in other words, God, God has done this. So yes, one comes, one comes by natural means, the other through faith. One is the son of a servant, the other is the son of a free woman. But Paul then goes on to say something that is fascinating. He says that these things are an allegory. What is an allegory? Well, according to the dictionary definition, an allegory is a story, poem, or picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning. So, so I say this like this. Now, I believe that these events really took place. You know, I believe that. Um, I don't think they're a parable. I think that Sarah was barren. God did con cause her to conceive. But I also believe that behind them is this deeper meaning. It's like God is saying something else through this situation as well. Um, Paul says, these are the two covenants. What two covenants? The old covenant and the new covenant. So each woman represents something deeper. We find out in verses 24 and 25 that Hagar the bondwoman, the, the servant, represents Mount Sinai. Now, Mount Sinai is significant since it was there that Moses received the law. Okay? Moses receives the law. But Paul also says that she represents the Jerusalem which now is. In other words, at the time that he's writing this. So the Jerusalem that exists at the time of Paul's writing is the Jerusalem which now is. But he also states that that Jerusalem is in bondage with her children, just as Hagar, the bondservant, 
and her child were born into this sort of servitude. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem are also in bondage both in two ways. Firstly to the law, but secondly to the Romans. Because the Romans are still uh, in charge. Remember it's under occupation in that country. And so he's saying, yeah, here's a series of kind of images if you like. You know, we've got like uh, Hagar, we've got Mount Sinai, where the law came, and we've got the Jerusalem that now is, and it represents um, a people who are in bondage. But Sarah represents the Jerusalem that is above heaven, or the new Jerusalem. And he goes on to say, the Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. So those who believe in Christ are free citizens of the new Jerusalem. We're free citizens of heaven above. That's a great way to think about it, isn't it? If I'm in Christ, if I believed on Jesus Christ and I've been born again by his spirit, I am a free citizen of heaven. That is my home, the new Jerusalem. And I, you know, I can't wait to get there because that, when I'm there, I'm back home. So, two women, two sons, two covenants, and two cities. In verse 28, it says, "Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. So we." Whether we are Jews or Gentiles, if we believe on Christ, then we are born not in a natural way, but in a supernatural way. Let's take a look at this idea. Gospel of John. Some of you will know exactly where I'm going. Gospel of John, chapter 3. Verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, that means truthfully, truthfully, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Born again. So born in a supernatural way. He goes on to say in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So I might say that Paul in Galatians 4 is setting forth two ideas, two peoples, two covenants. The first idea is that which is natural, earthbound, born of the flesh, connected to the city of Jerusalem that now is. The other is supernatural, eternal, born of the Spirit and connected to the new Jerusalem. Jerusalem, can say that which is heaven. The first represents the old covenant, the sign of which of course was physical circumcision. The second represents the new covenant, the sign of which is this circumcision of the heart. And it is as if Paul is presenting them to the Galatians and to others as a choice. He's saying which covenant do you want to be part of? Which agreement do you want to be part of? Now the choice is even more limited because in Hebrews 8 the writer says, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. The word here means obsolete. So the old, the old covenant is now obsolete. It is, it is ready to vanish away. So now there isn't two choices. There's not, oh well you could be under the old covenant or you could be under the new covenant. Now it's like the old covenant, that's gone, it's obsolete. 
But now there is this new covenant. And this is the issue which is at the heart of the Galatian problem. And at the heart of those Jews that are trying to be perfected by the law of Moses. The old covenant is gone. It was only ever uh, a temporary thing. And we know that it is fulfilled in Christ. Turn to Second Peter. Second Peter chapter one and verse nineteen. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. In other words, the prophetic sayings of the Old Testament were like lights shining in the dark, like little lamps. Wherever, you know, where there was darkness, where there was ignorance, where there was sin, and we saw it, I read from uh, Isaiah 53 this morning, right, that's a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. The like lamps in the darkness, those words that were spoken through the prophets, yeah, like lamps in the darkness. But, when Christ comes, until the day should dawn, Christ is their fulfilment, that is like the dawn coming up, that's what it's saying. Those prophetic words, they're brilliant. They're from God. They're like lights in the darkness. But when Christ came, that was like it's day. You know, it's like the dawn's coming. The sun's coming. It's like there's no darkness. There is the truth. There is Christ. It's fulfilled in Him. Christ is the bright and morning star, it says in Revelation 22, 16. And He will be revealed in and to your heart. So Paul is saying, why are you trying to get back to a light in the dark? Why are you trying to get back to these little lights that are here and there when you have the sun? When you have, the, when, in fact, when you have the S-O-N, you have the Son of God. There's no need to go back to those little lights in the dark. Good though they are, the fulfillment is here. Christ is here. Romans chapter 10. I just want to bring in a few scriptures now. Romans 10. My, uh, it says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Is that your heart's desire and prayer? For Israel this morning, that they might be saved. Not that they might all go back to the land, not that, you know, uh, they can get back what God owed them, but that they might be saved, because that's Paul's prayer for them. For I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. It's the end of the law. The very design of the law is to bring people to Christ for salvation both Jews and Gentiles. All the promises of God are met in Christ who is the fulfilment of the law. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in Him, in Christ, are yea, they are yes, and in Him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Christians need to understand four things with regard to the Old Covenant. Okay, four things. One, the Old Covenant prefigures Christ. Two, once Christ came, the Old Covenant became obsolete. Three, the New Covenant 
is now and will forever be the only covenant between God and man, whether you are Jewish or non-Jewish. And for any attempt at reinstating the old covenant is futile, foolish and an insult to the Lord Jesus Christ. Futile because it has been surpassed by the new. Foolish because it is digging up, uh, uh, because digging it up is unnecessary. At the beginning it said, oh foolish Galatians, do you remember that? Paul saying, you're foolish, you, you, you're digging up something that's gone. And it's an insult to Christ because if you reinstate animal sacrifices, you're saying he's not the Lamb of God. We need this animal sacrifice. He's not the end of the law. The law must go on. And that is an insult to Christ. He's the fulfillment of it. Christ is the mediator of a better covenant that was established upon better promises, Hebrews 8 and 6 says. What are those promises? Ezekiel 36, 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Because God's going to put his spirit within us and enable us to do that which he commands. Now this doesn't mean that Christians should regard the Old Testament part of the Bible as irrelevant. Or only of interest to the Jews. If that were the case, Paul would not be making reference to, to it to a predominantly Gentile New Testament church. But what it means is that we, we read it understanding that it foretells, foreshadows and foresees the coming, the character and the accomplishment of Christ. So in conclusion, I'll say this. Hagar, the bond servant, is used to symbolise the people who are in bondage. While Sarah is used to symbolise the people who are free. If you seek to establish your own righteousness without Christ, you will always be a slave, a slave to sin. But if you submit to Christ in faith, you will be set free. Because if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. This sermon is called the two covenants, but actually there is now only one covenant for all. As Jesus himself says in the Gospel of Luke, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. So this covenant is ratified in Christ's blood. It is sealed by Christ's spirit and only by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ do you enter into it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you Lord God for your word. I thank you Lord um, that we have your word before us that we've been able to hear the truth of your word. Father, help us to just serve you, Lord, and to enter into that new covenant, uh, to trust in you, and to, to be part of that agreement, that uh, covenant between God and man, that we might live lives that are to your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.